Good morning, and welcome back to Read the Bible for Life. And I was actually with y'all last week, even though I wasn't here physically. I was watching the online from Colorado. I was out there with Steve for the North American Mission Board trustee and spouse meeting. But I stayed up in the hotel room that morning, had my laptop all propped up, and my book, and my Bible, and my notebook, and I just followed right along. George did such a great job, and I told him uh, that we all thoroughly enjoyed him, and I knew that you did as well. So it's pretty exciting to be able to have the author of the curriculum we've been using this year to come and kind of help us bridge the gap between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I'm sure you've been enjoying reading in the New Testament this week and reading the Gospels. I want us to go to Malachi, the last prophet of the Old Testament, the last one to prophesy He was the last one through whom God spoke. Turn to Malachi chapter 4 because it is the perfect bridge into the New Testament. Malachi chapter 4, last book of the Old Testament. He was the last prophet. He prophesied approximately about 100 years after the initial return and the rebuilding of the temple. And he says, For behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff. And the day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. You will tread down, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet. On the day which I am preparing, says the Lord of hosts, remember the law of Moses, my servant, even the statutes and ordinances which I commanded him in Horeb for all of Israel. Behold, I am going to send you Elijah. Now this is a prophecy about John the Baptist, an Elijah-type figure. The prophet, before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord, he will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. Now, let's turn in our Bibles to Luke chapter 1. Because after God spoke through Malachi, there would be 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament until God would break that silence when he appeared to a man. A man named Zechariah. Look in Luke chapter 1 and let's begin with verse 8. Now it happened that while he was performing his priestly service before God in the appointed order of his division, according to the custom of the priestly office, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were in prayer outside at the hour of the incense offering. And an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar of incense. Zacharias was troubled when he saw the angel, and fear gripped him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will give him the name John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb, and he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him, talking about Christ, in the spirit and power of Elijah. Remember Malachi? To turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children. That's a quote from him. And the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous. So as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zechariah said to the angel, how will I know for certain? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. The angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God. And I have been spent to, sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you shall be silent And unable to speak until the day when these things take place. Because you did not believe my words which will be fulfilled in their proper time. The angel Gabriel who experiences the very presence of God was here to give a message to Zacharias. Now I want you to think with me just a moment. 
Back in 1 Chronicles chapter 24, King David, in preparation for the temple that Solomon was going to build, divided all of the, the lineage, the priestly lineage, up into 24 groups. And each of the 24 groups were allotted a specific two-week period that they would come to Jerusalem and they would assist the other priests and the Levites in the sacrifices and the offerings and the giving of incense for that two-week period. At the other times, they'd go back to their small towns and they would serve in the synagogues and their towns and their villages. But this was Zacharias' time that had been determined all the way back under King David. That Zacharias would be in Jerusalem serving his two weeks and would be chosen by lot to go in and offer the incense because God had an appointment with Zacharias. So God was orchestrating and putting all of this into place all the way back under King David. When he gave the various family divisions their two-week time slot, knowing hundreds of years later, Zacharias would be serving at the temple and would be chosen to go in to offer incense. And God would send Gabriel, the angel, to give him a message that would break the 400-year silence. And that the Elijah one, the one prophesied to come and prepare the way for the Lord, for the Messiah, the long-awaited one... He and Elizabeth were going to bear this child. Now, he says he was advanced in years. Troubles me just a little bit because priest had to retire at 50. <laughs> so I'm thinking he couldn't have been too terribly advanced. But obviously, they were beyond the typical age of childbearing, right? And yet he went in to offer the incense and to pray on behalf of, of, of his people. But what was on his heart? The fact that he wanted a son. Because what did Gabriel say? God has sent me with a message to tell you. He's granting the request of your heart. He knows this is the desire of your heart. And God is going to grant this desire for you, Zacharias. And he doesn't believe. And so what does God do? He says, okay, you're not going to be able to speak until the time that this is fulfilled. And we know that God does bless them with a child. Blesses them with John the Baptist. And he is the forerunner, the announcer of the one who is to come, Jesus Christ. Wow. Is that not amazing? All of the details, all of the, the intricate ways that God moves and works in history to fulfill his purposes and his plans and to have the right people at the right place at just the right time. There is nothing that is impossible for our God. So as we look at our world and the increase of evil and we look at our nation and the unrest and the division, we can understand God is sovereign. God is still moving and working and he is orchestrating everything according to his ultimate plan, which will be the preparation for Christ's second coming. So we are not to worry. We are not to fear or be dismayed. We are to continue to fix our eyes on Jesus and long for that day we see him face to face. In the meantime, we are to immerse ourselves in his word like we're doing now so so that we can live out his word and advance his kingdom on earth. Not the world's kingdom. Not even our own nation. Even though we are blessed to be in the United States of America. And we need to take part in voting and being involved in the political landscape. But that is not, our hope is not there. Our hope is in the Lord, in the ultimate kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. Which now resides within us through the Holy Spirit. So we can be confident. We can be at peace in the midst of chaos, because we know the one who's in charge. And we know that ultimately his purposes will be fulfilled. So as we've moved into the Gospels this, uh, this past week, you're looking at now the account of the coming of Christ, the first coming. And it's told through four different people. And we know as we look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that God does not, when he speaks through a man, obliterate their personality. Because what you have here is these eyewitness accounts. Matthew, Mark, and John are eyewitnesses. Luke gathered his. He may have seen some things, but he gathered most of his information from firsthand accounts for Luke and for Acts. And you're getting their four perspectives on the events surrounding the coming of Christ and his ministry. And it would be like us four of us viewing a traffic accident or something else happening and then we're recounting it, various things stick out to different people, right? A lot of it has to do with your background, how you're programmed, your temperament and personality. Well, that's what you're seeing with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But it's also God's chosen them on purpose because they're actually writing for specific groups of people. 
For instance, Matthew is specifically writing to the Jews. And over and over in the Gospel of Matthew, you're going to hear him say that the Scripture might be fulfilled. He's speaking to a Jewish audience who understands and has a grasp of the Old Testament. They've studied the Old Testament Scriptures. So when he says this is a fulfillment of this specific verse, then they're, oh, wow. That is what God had promised. That is God's word being fulfilled. So he's making those connections for them. And it's in the, uh, the book of Matthew that we really see Christ portrayed as king. Um, in the book of Mark, we see Christ primarily as a servant. And it is written specifically for the Romans. It's believed to have been written first. And it is the gospel of action. I mean, you don't even have, you know... The announcement of the birth and the coming of Christ, it just jumps right in. Mark just jumps right in. You just take off. And it's literally the book of action. And then in the book of Luke, you've got Christ as the son of man. And he's writing primarily for the Greeks. Luke was believed to have been a doctor, a physician. He includes a lot of details. He also includes the miraculous announcements that we just read of the birth of John the Baptist, the birth of Jesus. You get uh, Elizabeth's salutation when Mary comes to see her, and she is blown away that the mother of her Lord would come to her, and John the Baptist is filled with the Holy Spirit in her womb, and he leaps within her. Then we have the beautiful Magnificat of Mary, the song of Mary in response to this salutation. He is including all of this in his gospel. Um, you have got the words of praise from Zechariah as well, when God grants them the birth of John the Baptist. And then in John, we have Christ as the Son of God. And it's written for all people. This gospel is filled with references to Christ's divinity. In fact, even the way it begins. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We know from the very beginning, Jesus Christ is the Word, and the Word became flesh. He is God. So John just jumps right in from the beginning, proving the divinity of Christ. Which is why when you're witnessing to someone, quite often people will encourage them or for a new believer to start in the book of John. Because it starts from the, you know, in the beginning, Genesis was Jesus. He was God and the beginning was with him and everything came into being through him. And so we understand that he has always existed. He is God in the flesh. And then once you've read John, then to go back and read Matthew, Mark, and Luke and to see how they all fit together. So we have the birth of the Messiah. Henrietta Mears says there are four Gospels with one Christ, four account, accounts with one purpose, and four sketches of one person. So that's what we have. And it's really fun to go through and read these accounts together as you're working through the Scripture chronologically. So then we've got the birth of the Messiah. And there are many prophetic fulfillments surrounding Christ's birth. I've given you just a few on your handout here. For instance, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Let's look at Luke um, 1, 26. Go back to verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and was kept pondering what kind of salutation this one. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age. And she who was called barren is now in her sixth month, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now we know from Mary's Magnificat that she knew a lot of Old Testament scriptures because she's quoting a lot of scriptures and her blessing and praise back to the Lord. But we also know she would have recognized in this angelic announcement that he was quoting scripture to her. And the long-awaited Messiah was the one of whom he's speaking. Can you even imagine? 
as a teenage girl encountering an angel, but then the long-awaited one, the one your people had been waiting so long for to know that God had chosen you, and her response is so beautiful. Behold the bond slave of the Lord. I am a willing servant of yours. Be it done to me according to your word. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. Sounds like Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, does it not? Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. She knew what faced a young woman found pregnant outside of wedlock. Death. Being stoned to death. We, we can't conceive that now because we don't live in this culture. So for us, it's like, oh, she just was willing to, you know, how awesome. that she, No, she had no idea how God was going to work all this out. She didn't know, but she trusted him because God had been faithful in his promises to her people. And she said, behold, the bond slave of the Lord. Do with me whatever you desire. And that should be the heart of each one of us today as well because our God is so faithful. In Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, it says, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. This was a prophecy given 700 years before its fulfillment. That's how long the people had been longing and waiting for the promised one. And then there's prophecies about where Christ would be born. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. That's a prophecy from Micah 5, chapter 2. And we know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And in Jeremiah, God prophesied and said, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. And we know Jesus was of the lineage of David. We know that he is the one that God was pointing to and prophesying about. But we also know that during that time, Herod and evil people would come against the Christ child. The enemy would want to destroy him. And we know that Herod did when he found out where discerned where the Christ had been born in Bethlehem. He had all little boys killed from two and under. And that was prophesied also in Jeremiah when it says, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Fulfilled and recorded for us in Matthew chapter 2. The weeping and that verse literally over and over you'll see in Matthew that the scriptures might be fulfilled and that it quotes the Old Testament passage in the midst of what's actually happening among the people. I gave you some other Old Testament prophecies and their fulfillment on your handout. Those came from the website Answers in Genesis. That's a tremendous resource if you've not accessed their materials before. I highly recommend it. Okay, this past week we also read about the temptation of Christ. You know, it's interesting, we know very little about his childhood. Really, the only story we have in Scripture is when he accompanied his parents to Jerusalem when he was 12, and he stays behind, and he's in the temple, and he, we know from just that account that he at least understood who he was. He was fully God, but fully human, and yet he understood God was his father, because how did he respond to his parents when they found him? Didn't you know I'd be in my father's house? I mean, how could you not have come here first to look? for me. He understood he was the son of God and yet in his humanity still had to pray and walk with him just as we do by faith. Without a sin nature but he still was human and had to relate to God the same way that we do. So I want us to look at his temptation because what we see pictured in Christ is a fulfillment of everything we've witnessed as we've read through the Old Testament. And the Israelites were in the wilderness how many years? 40 years. How many days is Jesus going to be in the wilderness? 40. It, it is typifying the 40 years in the wilderness and where the Israelites failed <laughs> every temptation they were faced with, Jesus Christ is going to succeed and he is going to refute the enemy using the word of God against him. He will prevail for us. Doing what we were unable to do, he is doing for us. So in Matthew chapter 4, just after Jesus has been baptized, he's going to be led out into the wilderness to be tempted by the evil one. Let's pick up at verse 1 in chapter 4. He's approximately 30 years old at this time. 
Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, boy, do we not still hear that voice. If you really belong to the Lord, or if that's what God really said. If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. <clears throat> but he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And that's a direct quotation from Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, On the other hand, it is is written <laughs> you shall not put the lord your god to the test a direct quote of deuteronomy 6 verse 16 again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory and he said to him all these things i will give you if you fall down and worship me then jesus said to him go satan for it is written you shall worship the lord your god and serve him only a quotation from Deuteronomy 6, verse 13. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. Now what we're seeing here is Jesus being victorious over the enemy and over sin and temptation on our behalf. Because he is going to be tempted in all ways just as we are, yet without sin, so that he can offer himself in our place on the cross. Because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. We know that God established that from the very beginning, that it takes the shedding of the blood of the innocent on behalf of the guilty to cover our sins. The good news with Jesus Christ is he doesn't just cover our sins, he wipes them away. And it's not just every year. No, it's offered one, one time, once for all. And when you come to him in repentance and faith, he wipes your sin away. What kind of temptations did he face? Because I think we need to understand that there are categories of sin. The enemy knows us. He is not omniscient, but he is observant. <laughs> and he does know where we're weak and where we are more uh, liable to fall. And so he hits us in those areas. In fact, 1 John 2.16 says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And you could take these three temptations and line them up. Up under the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life. And one time I was reading through this passage and it just jumped out at me that I faced these same temptations. And the first one where it's turned the, the, uh, the stones into bread is to satisfy some desire, lust of your flesh. And I felt like the Lord was saying, okay, Donna, you're either going to satisfy the flesh or the spirit. You're either going to fix your mind on the flesh or fix your mind on the spirit. And the mindset on the flesh is what? Death. But the mindset on the, flat, the spirit is life and peace. We know that from Romans chapter 8. So we've got to choose not to satisfy the flesh, but to choose to satisfy the spirit. And we are to respond against the enemy with the same tool, the same weapon that Jesus Christ used, which is the sword of the spirit, the word of God. So wherever you're, you know that you're weak, that you're open to temptation in a particular area, ask God to give you a word from his word so that you can say, it is written. So that you can say, no. I was speaking to an, an older man recently who really struggles with worry. And he was just all bent out of shape. And he was talking to Steve and I about just being so worried about a specific thing. And this thing he was worried about, I'm thinking, that's just really no big deal. But, you know, when you're worried about it, it's a big deal to you, right? <laughs> I mean, on the outside looking in, I'm thinking, blow that off. You know, that's probably not even going to happen. But that's, for him, it was imminent. It was, it was looming over him. And to be able to say, you know, you've been a believer for a really long time. And when you allow the enemy to get you under the accusation, the worry, the anxiety, whatever it may be, you're not living above the accuser like we talked about when we looked at Zechariah. And I said, have you ever really actively tried to take thoughts captive? And he says, well, I, I kind of have. I said, no. You can't kind of do it. <laughs> You've got to diligently take those thoughts captive. You've got to refuse them entrance. The first time you have that, you get up in the morning and that anxious thought hits you or that feeling of fear or worry, you've got to know. That's not from the Lord. Even if you say it out loud, no, <laughs> it's not from the Lord. And you replace it with, you know, I'm going to be anxious for nothing. 
but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, I'll let my request be made known to God. And then, God, I'm going to claim your peace that passes all comprehension to guard my heart and mind in Christ Jesus. You take God's word and use it against the enemy, whatever your issue may be. And saw him a couple of days later, and he goes, it's working. <laughs> It's working. He said, I had a really hard time the next day, but today I'm walking in victory. Christ died to purchase victory. We're not to live in the flesh. He gave us the tools, the weapons we need to fight the battle in the spirit. It is a spirit fought and won battle. It is not a battle against flesh and blood. And we have to remember that. So we've got to understand we're going to be tempted by the enemy to trust the flesh over the spirit. But we're also going to be tempted to trust or test. What did he say? You're not to test the Lord your God. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to test God. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to trust that he is going to be faithful to his word. He's going to do exactly what he said he will do. And then the last one, when he said, just bow down to me, I'll give you a shortcut. You really don't have to go to the cross. I'll give you everything that you see. And you know what? It's under his control at this point. And what did Jesus say? Be gone. <laughs> That's it. You cross the line. You shall worship no other God but the Lord alone. And Satan left him for a more opportune time. Don't we wish he would just vanish? <laughs> Unfortunately, he comes back. So we have to stay alert and sober so that we will crucify and not compromise. And that's exactly what the enemy was testing him to do on that last one. Tempting him to compromise instead of crucifying the flesh. Because our flesh wants a shortcut. I don't know about you, but my flesh wants vengeance sometimes. My flesh wants to set things right. And I have to go, nope. I am crucifying those fleshly desires. And Lord, you are my defender. You are my shield. You are my rear guard. You are my refuge. You are my defense. I will seek you and you only. I will trust you and you only. And as we fix our eyes on him and set our mind on things above, he literally lifts us above the circumstances of our life and allows us to live in victory over the evil one, to be able to stand firm in those times of temptation when he... Have you ever just felt assaulted? You know, sometimes it feels like those fiery darts are coming like this, doesn't it? And that's when you have to lift that shield of faith. And sometimes you've got to call a friend, a friend that you know walks with Jesus and say, hey, I'm being bombarded today. Would you pray with me? Would you pray for me? And pray with them, pray for each other. You can do that over the phone. You can do it in, pres you know, in person, but you can do it over the phone. You can call and pray with somebody over the phone. Don't try to do this alone. If the enemy is bombarding you, Call a trusted friend and share and ask them to pray with you. That's how we defeat the evil one. And you know what? We do it together because God is all about relationship. And we think about Christ's ministry. We know it began at about the age of 30, lasted for about three and a half years. And in John 17, when he's praying for his disciples, for his followers, one of the things he says is, Lord, I, Father, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And I've told you this before, man, that is the desire of my heart. To be able to come to the end of the days the Lord allots me on this planet and to be able to stand before him and know I've completed his purpose and plan for my life. That I've accomplished what it was he had for me to do. And Jesus was able to say that just after three and a half years of ministry. I have fulfilled everything you had for me to do. And the next thing is the cross. Because he was praying with his disciples just before heading out to the Garden of Gethsemane and Calvary's cross. So as we look at Christ and all he's done for us, to me the obvious question is, so what's your story? How has he written you into the grand narrative of his story? What's your testimony? And I want to encourage you to be able to give your testimony either briefly or if you have an extended amount of time to be able to sit down with somebody and walk them through scripture and show them how Christ is who he claimed to be. To be able to tell somebody what your life was like before Christ. How you met him. How he drew you to repent, believe, and receive him as your Lord and Savior. And then how he changed your life. What's your life like now that the spirit of the living God lives within you? It should be different. There should be change. There should be continuing change in our life because we're being sanctified. We're being changed every day into a greater likeness of Jesus Christ. That's part of what he does for us until the day we're ultimately glorified and we receive our resurrected body and we are just as he is. And that's the day we look forward to. But in the meantime, what's he doing in your life? 
We traveled last week. I was with Steve. We were in Denver for the North American Mission Board uh, trustee and spouse meetings. And then we went to just outside Los Angeles in Ontario, California, for the dedication of Gateway Seminary. Golden Gate that was in San Francisco sold their very expensive property and were able to purchase a, a beautiful place just outside Los Angeles. And it's Gateway Seminary now. So we were there for the dedication. And the next morning we flew to Montana for Steve to speak at the Montana State Convention, their Baptist Convention. Everywhere we went, God gave us amazing opportunities to share the gospel. And, you know, it's, it's so cool when you're out in some of these, especially like in Montana, where it's, it's um, one of those places there are not a lot of churches there. In fact, I think there are like 180-something churches in the entire state of Montana, and they all came together for their Baptist State Convention as well as some of their additional staff. There are only about 200 people there. But I want to tell you the camaraderie, the friendship, because they need each other. <laughs> they, they're lonely out there, and they're in these pioneer areas that don't have a church on every corner like we do here in the South and so many of our cities. And so it's so fun to go into these places where people don't really have any background. And we were coming back. Um, we have several stories I could tell you. And every time Steve gets to share the gospel with somebody, he asks them for their address and he wants to mail them one of his books, and then also we send him a Bible. So we were coming back in the airport, and we were just killing time because we had a couple of hours uh, in the Minneapolis airport, and we walked in a Johnson & Murphy store. And there were three young men over there talking at the cash register. And so I picked out a shirt for Steve. I said, this is, I really like this. Go, tr go try this on. You need to get this shirt. And so he's back there trying it on. And I'm hearing this one young man, Jock, talk to these two other young men. And they're talking about theology and mythology. And Jock's telling them that mythology came first and that theology came out of mythology, and they're both just trying to explain God. Well, you can just imagine what that was doing to me. I mean, my skin was crawling. You know, I was like, oh. And I said, well, you know, actually, you might just have that backwards. <laughs> I said, theology actually came first because the God who created the universe came down to man and made a covenant with the man, Abraham. And that happened over 1,500 years before the Greeks were in charge and created their gods to try to explain away the God. He said, well, you know, I'm a Christian. I didn't think that sounded right. <laughs> and so we start talking about the gospel. And the moment we start talking about the gospel, the two other young men part. You know, they're like, whoa, wait a minute, this is getting way too serious for us. And so when Steve comes out and he's purchasing his shirt, well, the other young man had to come back to the cash register. Well, Jock had to leave because he was on lunch break and had to go back to his store. And so Nick was standing there with his tattoos and his ear gauges and looking like someone who would not be the least bit interested in Christianity or the gospel or Jesus Christ. And yet as we began to talk and to pick back up on that conversation, he told us, he said, you know, I'm not a Christian. I don't really believe the Bible, but I do have a grandmother that's a Christian. And so we stood and talked with him. Steve was able to share the entire gospel with him. He, you just saw the defenses melt. And he opened up, and we got, he gave us his card. And Steve said, I've written a book about prayer I would love to send to you. And it's got the, you know, it's got the gospel in it. And we're going to send him a Bible and tell him, if you'll start reading in John and then read the other gospels, you're going to see who Jesus is and who the Bible says he is. He could not have been nicer when we left. So would you put Nick on your prayer list? And would you pray for him? God gave us such a connection with that young man. And it's so obvious just from his outward appearance. He's seeking, he's hurting, and he needs Jesus. As we've been reading through Scripture, we've said the most important question we ask when we open the Word of God is, what is God revealing about himself? Think with me just a moment. We're going to trace a theme through Scripture, okay? We're going back to Genesis. God spoke eight times in Genesis chapter 1 in creation, and matter moved. Things began to change, right? Things came into being when God spoke. We know that the Bible opens by telling us the Spirit was hovering over the face of the deep. God the Father is speaking we know from John chapter 1 that Jesus was there. He was, the literal cre he was the little agent through which all was created. He is the word that God spoke. So we have the Trinity, the Godhead, in relationship and a beautiful oneness of essence. 
God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he creates man in his image. And what did he say? Let us create man in our image. So you see the Trinity speaking among themselves, relating, connecting, one and yet separate. Let us make man in our image. And so he creates Adam and Eve, and they are a reflection of his image. And Adam and Eve in the garden are what? They're made one by God through marriage, and they're naked and unashamed. So we know there's innocence there. There is no separation. When did the separation come? The point of sin. Sin separates. So the moment sin entered their lives and entered the garden, when they chose to believe the serpent instead of God, separation, pain, anxiety, fear entered their world. And now they're separated from God and separated from each other. Here's a really neat illustration. When we were at the Apologetics Institute this past summer, one of the speakers said that three-year-olds, and you know this, two- and three-year-olds, if they cover their eyes, they think you can't see them because they can't see you, right? So that's why sometimes they'll hide, and they're standing behind a chair where they're obvious, and yet they cover their eyes, so they assume you have no idea where they are, right? But psychologists actually call what happens between the age of three and four as falling from grace, because at about age four, children begin to recognize they are separate and that they can know and hide things from others. That's exactly what happened when sin entered. There was no separation. But after sin, now there's separation with God and separation in relationships. But Jesus Christ came that he might be the way back to the Father and to the oneness that God originally intended for us to experience. The Word of God became flesh. And dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. Glory as of the only begotten from the Father. Full of grace and truth. John 1, 14. Jesus was and is the language God speaks. In Matthew, or actually turn to John 17. Jesus has just done his final teaching. He's had the last Passover, which becomes the Lord's Supper with his disciples. He's taught them in 14 through 16, and in 17, he's praying for them. We call this the high priestly prayer. He begins praying for himself, and then he prays for all believers. Let's pick up in verse 20 of John 17. Christ said, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. No more division, no more separation. Even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, Although the world has not known you, yet I have known you. And these have known that you sent me. And I have made your name known to them and will make it known. So that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. Now when did that happen? On the day of Pentecost. When God sent his Holy Spirit to literally baptize them in the Spirit and to fill them. When we are saved, we are regenerated. Our spirit man comes back to life, which was dead. That's part of the consequences of sin. That's why we were separated from God. We could no longer connect with him spirit to spirit. But now our spirit man has come back to life. The Holy Spirit comes to live within us. We are sealed by his spirit. And we are invited into the Trinitarian relationship. We are invited into the oneness that God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have experienced since before time as we know it began. That's what Christ has purchased 
for us. Peter said you have been given, you become partakers of the divine nature. We have the down payment. We have a, a, a foreshadowing of what is to come through the Holy Spirit who comes to live with us. And yet this same Jesus, when he was on the cross, this one who had never known separation, would cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus cried out, and for the first time in all of eternity, there was no answer. He was separated from the Father because of my sin and because of your sin. That we might be purchased, bought, brought in once he conquered sin, death, hell, and the grave. He rose victorious to offer to us that right relationship with God once again. Now in Christ, we are one. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit and we are a part of the body of Christ. That means we're connected. We're united. We've been brought into this Trinitarian relationship. If you are in Christ Jesus, you are now in that fellowship. So we're to have one heart and one mind in Christ Jesus. So is it any wonder that the enemy works so hard to divide, to separate, to bring sin? Because what does sin do? It separates. We are accountable to one another. But what do we want to say? Don't tell me how to live. Don't, don't you get on to me. Get that log out of your eye before you start picking on the speck in mine. And yet we are connected to one another. And we are accountable to each other. And it's so much easier to go, well, you know, she's going to do what she's going to do or he's going to do what he's going to do. No. <laughs> what did Jesus do? He took our place. And the only way you can take the place for another person is to pray for them and then to go after them which is what Jesus has called us to do. He came to seek and to save those who were lost. And praise his name, he did not give up on us. When we were at our worst, Christ died for us. Not when we deserved it, not when there was any sliver of hope that we would respond to it, even though he knows all things. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And we are to be about his business, which means we must diligently preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace among God's people. We must stand firm against the schemes of the enemy to come in and divide his people, whether it's denominationally or whether it's some petty argument among theology. And you, you know, I see people sometimes on social media going to town over things, and I just think, really? Like the entire world is dying and on its way to hell, and really? That's what you're focused on? That is a distraction of the evil one. And he's feeding our flesh and we're falling for it. <laughs> and yet Jesus Christ, the very word of God, bled for us on that cross. That we might enter into that oneness of relationship that he prayed for us in John chapter 17. So Genesis to Revelation, it tells a story. In fact, as one said, it sings a song, if you will, the song of Jesus. And we have been invited to sing along, <laughs> to tell the story of the ages that God is good. And he has provided the way back to knowing and experiencing God, and his name is Jesus. A way back to all we know we've lost. Oh, won't you turn to Jesus today? Release all the other ways you've been trying to get to God or make life work and just repent, believe, and receive. Let's pray. Oh, Father, Lord, I am so amazed every time I study your word. You continue to make connections. You continue to open my eyes to truths I've missed before. Lord, I, I've known that sin separates but the beauty of what Christ prayed for us and then purchased for us on the cross is mind-blowing. That you have invited us into the relationship you have enjoyed before time began. Oh, Father, may we be more focused on you and on being right in right relationship with you than on anything else. 
And God, as you fill us to overflowing with your spirit, will you help us to have eyes for your kingdom, not the kingdoms of this world. Father, you raise up kings, you put them down. Everything is coming together to be, Father, just the perfect fulfillment of your prophecies for the end of time. And God, we know that. So help us not to be distracted by the things going on in the world, but instead to fix our eyes on the kingdom of heaven and to be about advancing your kingdom by telling others about Jesus, by sharing a word of testimony, by letting them know how you've changed our lives. And then, Lord God, by allowing you through your spirit to knit us together with other believers and to lovingly hold each other accountable and lift each other up and pray for each other and be there to cheer each other on. Because, Lord God, we want to cross the finish line having been faithful. Oh, Lord, help us to be faithful that we might be able to stand before you when we see you face to face and know we have completed everything you had for us in this life. Lord, we love you. We bless you. We praise you. We give you all honor and glory. And we tell you that we long for the day we get to see you face to face. But until that time, oh Lord God, make us heralds of the good news that Jesus saves. And we ask it in his precious name, the name above all names, the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you.